Good evening, St. John's. I've got some long rambling thoughts today, so bear with me. Uh, and they're political, but don't worry, I don't think they're political in the way that it's going to upset anyone, or at least <laughs> not too much. Um, I think every vocation has had its particular struggles associated with these past uh, several years, of uh, both the pandemic and the political tension. And for the clergy, especially the preaching clergy, one of the particular struggles has been, how do you respond to this from the pulpit? How do you respond in a way that is true with your convictions about what the kingdom of God are without becoming unnecessarily partisan uh, and sounding like you're either a Democrat or a Republican uh, stumping for your candidate? Because obviously our faith has significant ramifications uh, for how we think society should exist and what we should do. How we live out the kingdom of God is everything. Uh, and so the struggle has been particularly uh, with the political situation. Um, let me back up a little. The weight the church bears uh, in the latter half of the 20th, 20th century and beyond is forever the fear that we would become like the complicit evangelical church in, during Nazi Germany that was largely silent, that went along bit by bit with what Hitler did. Uh, that weighs on all of us uh, preachers uh, that we would never become complicit in a way they were. And for many people, whether you agree with them or not, uh, for many people, what they saw developing in the Trump years seemed to them uh, akin to the development uh, of Nazism. Uh, the similar tactics, rhetoric, um, response from the populace. Uh, and there was a sincere fear that something like that was happening uh, and that their particular call, their particular response as ministers and preachers was to not be complicit as they were before. So, of course, as soon as they started saying these things, uh, it became offensive to those on the right. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to that because I feel the same burden or have felt uh, the same burden and confusion, the weight, the responsibility, the struggle. But as of late, I've been considering a different historical model that might be even more relevant to us today. As many of you know, I used to live in Northern Ireland. I lived there during the Troubles and was part of a ministry of reconciliation. And let me tell you this about Northern Ireland. I have never witnessed or been part of a more sincerely religious culture. In every sense of the word, it's easy for us in America uh, just to regard the violence as a hypocrisy in the church and leave it at that, a bunch of hypocrites. But if you lived there, you would understand they take their faith really seriously uh, in ways that American culture just doesn't even recognize. Uh, be it Catholic or Protestant, their faith saturates every aspect of their life, their politics, their economics, their, their leisure time, everything. And this is what happened in Northern Ireland. Uh, each side, the Catholics and the Protestants, had the fervor that their side was not only right, it was divinely right. And there's no one who could hate like someone who believes God is on their side. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Uh, that people were deeply impassioned about their view they believed that God was on their side. And here's what happened. Built into the fabric of the culture and the church was this permission to hate the other. They wouldn't have said it that way, but it was true. Uh, there was this outrage at the other who was wrong. And they had permission to be outraged and therefore permission to hate and therefore permission to do violence. And as I look at what's happening in America, and in particular in the American church, I'm seeing this same extreme kind of polarization developing uh, between what we would call left and right. Uh, that each side is not only fervent in their belief, 
but fervent in their belief that God is with them. And it's leading to this posture where we're allowed to hate and we're allowed to have violence. In America, let me tell you this, Northern Ireland is never a good example for us to follow and how we're developing our religious and political identity. Ever. Yes, we've got to pursue what we believe to be the kingdom of God with integrity, but it never allows us to demonize and to hate, and certainly not to do violence. We do follow a Jesus who proclaimed the kingdom with boldness and authority and was also willing to be crucified and who told us, take up your cross and follow me. For all of us who are fervent on one side or another, but who then demand that our adversaries be the ones who suffer, something is going wrong with our religion. We're taking the easy route of outrage and not the costly right route of true discipleship. And what I also le learned in Northern Ireland is that one of the ways to respond with faith is repentance. Rather than pointing fingers at how wrong the other person is, is to look at your own soul and to see where I have been at fault for advocating and fostering an antithesis to the kingdom of God. And what I think is a common theme for many now is repentance for the mockery, the disdain, the dismissal, the dehumanization of our political adversaries. Jesus does not give us permission to hate, ever. And if we found that our hearts are in a posture of hating, particularly for those who are on the left who are now feeling a little triumphant because of uh, Biden, the call is to self-examination and confession for where we are being not like Jesus because we do want to see the kingdom of God made manifest throughout this world, that all would benefit. And especially for those of us whose faith has a particular language or orientation towards caring for the outcast, the vulnerable, the marginalized, could it be possible that that same sensitivity could include your adversaries? Let us pray. The Lord Almighty grant us a peaceful night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins to God. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us all our offenses, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May the Almighty God grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. 
For you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, you are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us, O Lord our God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord, O God of truth. Keep us, O Lord, as the apple of your eye. Hide us under the shadow of your wings. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of your only Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend to the sick, Lord Christ, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, pity the afflicted, shield the joyous, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see, a light to enlighten the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Guide us waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God, the Almighty and merciful Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Good night, Gig Harbor. <laughs>